there is certainly an air of we're going to get tough on everything. I mean, the practicalities of doing that can be quite tough, but there are some quite significant changes coming up. Um, sort of um, one of the sort of uh, areas that's going to be hit is uh, phoenixing, whereby mm -hmm. people are sort of NVLs. yeah, sort of liquidating their company, mm -hmm. taking out the funds. Most importantly, as a capital gain and being taxed a capital gains tax, and possibly even getting a ten percent rate if it, if uh, everything works in their favour. Um, they published draft or, or a consultation legislation on that and then quickly pulled it away again and said, well, we're probably just going to introduce this on the 1st of April, so that's all changing. We don't know how it's going to work. There's a lot of speculation that they're trying to challenge the fact of the actual phoenixing so that if you do it in the normal course, then you should still be able to benefit from capital gains. But if you go on and then carry on trading in a similar trade in any sort of entity, sole trader, partnership, or another company, which is quite often, that, that is quite common, then that's what they're trying to attack. So there's lots of changes coming up. Well, that, that's always, it's always been the case, isn't it, that if you do the same business, then it, it can be questioned. But uh, I, I, was, I was arguing with some other accountants about a particular instance with property development. There was a lot of smaller property developers use companies that are for development specific. And they're mm, like 10 yes, houses yeah. or 12 houses. Yeah. And they're very good commercial reasons for operating it as a separate company, aren't they? And then, and then folding it in because, the, again, it's the difference between the people working in the business and the investors. You might have people with 50,000, 100,000, several investors in who've got no interest in the company other than the return on the investment. So for them, it's logical and proper and correct that the company should be uh, solvently liquidated and they take their money out. If they stop that, I think there will be an in adverse impact on house building. There, there, there could be. I haven't sort of um, actually sort of uh, applied thought to that really, but um, you're right. I've seen situations where specific developments get a specific company, and yeah. once that development has gone and sold, the company's wound up and they move on to the next one. So it is a form of phoenixing to some extent. Because it's the same activity building, but it's a, yeah. but they're yeah. but they're very good commercial I mean, one reasons for doing it. Overriding thing that is effective against most anti-avoidance tax legislation is to convince the revenue that you've got a bona fide commercial reason. And that's a very strong argument. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of is probably the main defense against any attack using anti-avoidance legislation. So it's possible that you might be able to sort of build up an argument against that. You wouldn't want to be the first one. No, that's right. Because <laughs> it could be quite costly to sort of win that argument. In the courts, yeah, but yeah, that yeah. my first thoughts are that maybe you go down that route to try and you know build a defence as you go along because you know what you're going to do. Mm. And my sort of advice anyway is if you know if you have a plan, it's better to build your defences yeah. before your plan starts, or certainly in the early stages, because once your defences are there, well, one, one of the up. things that you can you can do to soften the risk is to pay reasonable salaries, I and mean, it's quite trite that startup companies pay themselves eight or ten thousand pounds to no more than that, and they pay themselves the rest through dividends. And if yeah. you know, after a while and the company's got a reasonable turnover, it starts to look a little bit odd. So I guess in those circumstances, you could build in some reasonably defensible commercial salaries. Then you can say, well, this isn't this guy's remuneration. We've got decent salaries. This is genuine profit, mm. perhaps. One of the dangers of building up funds within the company is that the revenue don't like the fact, and um, it has several repercussions, I guess. Um, all the rules on dividends are changing, so that's going to stop this sort of, or, or certainly sort of change the scenario whereby sort of there are a huge amount of co companies, certainly that we deal with, and I guess right across the country, that either a single, single director paying themselves £10,000 salary and drawing all the rest of the profits out as dividends. There's nothing illegal about that, and it's tax effective. You save straight away national insurance, both for the employee and the employer. So, y you know, any person can sit down and say, well, that's the way to do it because it save, saves money. They're attacking that, or certainly changing it, because uh, from now on, the concept of a tax credit attaching to a dividend and that covering your basic rate 
So a tax liability goes out the window from 1st of April. Um, 5,000 pounds of dividend income is going to be tax free. And then after that, it's going to be banded from 7.5 to 32 point whatever it is. And so it's going to change that scenario. Um, then, I guess building up funds, you, you, you've got to watch it in two ways. I mean, we, we certainly have companies that have huge amounts of money. And I had an argument yesterday with one of my directors in that he said, well, why are you telling me about this now? I said, because it's just changing now, you know, about mm -hmm. sort of the, the distribution. I said, you know, and we, we can't be certain. He said, well, you know, my companies are building up funds. I said, well, you should have been talking to them from the outset, <laughs> you, you know, about building up funds inside a company because it can be challenged. One of the challenges is that if you build up too much funds and then change, diversify change, that change, investment, changing the nature of the, the trade, you, you could you? find that by measurement, and the measurements are sort of pretty, you know, um, arbitrary it seems, that your actual business does less business than your investment. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. your company may not be a trading company and you're not entitled to entrepreneur's relief, which is going to be an 18% tax deficit effectively because you won't be able to claim 10% if you sell up. So lots of different things. But again, I think if you start minuting why you're building up funds, because there's a business plan behind it, you're building your defence. You don't have to offer that fence to revenue until it, at a time when they're likely. But if you've got a document that was drawn up several years ago and said, this is the reason why we're doing this. It, it's might, be very it might be that you're planning to invest in a new to, building or planning to, to buy then, another target. There's use your good reasons. reason yeah. alongside any other reason why you might want to build up funds in the company to build it up. You know, just, just for winning contracts, to having a, a solid sort of balance sheet, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what your customers want. They want that security. But write it down, put it in a minute, date it, stick it in the minute book, when the tax man comes along and says, oh, look, you've been sort of invested, you've just been building up these funds, you know, your business isn't trading, you can come back with a real solid argument and the revenue back down very quickly yeah, on good, that type of good thing. Advice. They do. Very good advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, that's good.